Good morning. Welcome to worship today, those of you here in person, those watching online. You know, Jesus spent time, even in the midst of his busy schedule, talking to his heavenly Father in prayer. We're going to focus on that today in worship, uh, that gift and invitation that God gives to actually talk to him, uh, and he promises to listen in our prayers. Let's uh, take a moment to stand and greet those around you as we start today's service. continue with the opening song. i 
our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we come together to confess our sins to our loving God, knowing that He hears these prayers and forgives our sins, inviting us back into unity and righteousness with Him. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But But if if we we confess confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive forgive our our sins and and cleanse cleanse us from from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by by what we have have left undone. We We have have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the the sake sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sing a 
Our epistle reading for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward, but not of my own will. I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, that not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise now for our gospel reading. 
The Gospel according to the first chapter of Mark. Immediately, Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who, who were there with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated, and at this time I invite Pastor Dave up uh, for our children's message as well as the children. Yeah, Miss Jenny wasn't feeling so good today, so I'm going to take the children's message. Come on down, everybody. Come on. Good to have you guys here today. How's everybody doing this morning? Doing okay? All right, that's good. You know, I thought this morning we would start with a prayer for the children's message today. And I, I wanted to ask you, what should we pray about? What do you think? What should I pray about? Have any ideas? I'm going to start with a prayer. What should I talk to God about? What do you think? What's one thing I could talk to God about? Um, yeah, wow. We could just pray to God about our faith, right? Faith, faith in God and maybe give thanks to God for being with us and watching over us. Yeah. Does anybody know anybody who is sick? Anybody know anybody who's sick? Did you know in, this, in our school, at Peace Lutheran School last week, we had a lot of kids who were sick? Yeah, any of your classmates sick at school? And maybe teachers or other people? Think we should pray for them? Think that would be a good thing to pray about? I think so too. So we could, we could thank God for being God and praise Him. We could pray for people in need. What else should, do you think we should pray about? Let me ask you this tough question. Do you guys ever do anything wrong? Yes. <laughs> That's an easy one, right? We all make mistakes, don't we? And we use a word for that in, the, in church, at least. You know, it starts with an S. When we make mistakes, what is that? Sin. sin, right. Do you think it would be a good idea maybe to talk to God about our sins? And what should we ask Him for? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. So there's another good thing to pray about right? Pray for forgiveness. Can you think of anything else that really needs prayer? Do you think there are some problems in the world today? Can you think of any problems in the world today that you've heard about? What have you heard about in the world? Are there any wars going on? Yeah, there's some wars going on in the Middle East and Ukraine and other places. You've probably heard about those. Are there any, have there been any like flooding? Did you hear about flooding going on? I heard there's flooding in California. Did you hear about that? They've gotten, uh, I guess the drought is over there, right? No more drought in California. We can give thanks for that, but now they got flooding. Yeah, my daughter lives there. She's telling me about all the rain coming down. Yeah. What else, what else is going on? Has there been some... You know, there's been some places, I know this is hard to believe, there have been some places that have had blizzards. Yeah. And so much snow, it's building up in the mountains and causing avalanches. Can you believe it? I mean, around here, it's hard to tell, but... Yeah. Do you think that's a good thing to pray about? Boy, we've got a lot of stuff to pray about, don't we? All right, so let's pray about all that stuff. So I want you to repeat after me as we pray, all right? Dear Jesus, thank you for being God. 
and dying on the cross so we could be saved and rising from the dead so we will rise from the dead be with those who are sick help those who are in need help people who are suffering from floods and fires and avalanches and wars thank you Jesus for forgiving us all our sins amen so today's children's message you know it was really just one big prayer wasn't it because Jesus invites us to pray and talk to him all the time and that's such a neat thing to be able to talk to God and know that he listens to us all right you guys thanks for coming up you can have a, a treat here. Dane's going to help you out with that from the church, and we'll continue with our message about prayer. You know, Jesus had a busy day. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, records kind of his first full day of ministry. Now, he probably did a little bit of ministry before this day, but this is like his first 24-hour period of time when he is ministering to people. And some of you remember from maybe the last few weeks of gospel readings, or if you've been in our Bible study between services, we've been looking at Mark chapter 1 for a few weeks now. And we see that Jesus called his first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He had already been baptized in the Jordan River. He had gone through temptation with the devil in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then now he's starting his ministry with these first four disciples by going into this small fishing town on the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum. So he enters the synagogue. It's a Saturday morning. That's when people worship back in Jesus' time. And they go into the synagogue. And he was a new rabbi. So they invited the new guy to come and preach. Kind of like when Pastor Jared came in July. You know, he got to preach right away, almost at the beginning. You know, so the new rabbi's in town, and they invite Jesus to read some scripture and teach from the Old Testament. And he teaches as somebody with authority, the kind of authority they had not heard really ever in their life. Not from their current rabbis and scribes and Pharisees, certainly not from those guys. And then in the middle of Jesus' sermon, a man stands up and he starts shouting at Jesus. We know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? So this man filled with demons starts yelling at Jesus, and Jesus simply says, be quiet, come out of him. And the demons leave the man, and he, sh and he shrieks, screams, and he falls to the ground. Well, that pretty much, by the way, ended the church service, I think. You know, after that happens, then everybody leaves. <laughs> it's like, wow, what do we do now? Take the offering? I don't know. So at the end of the church service, Jesus goes to Peter and Andrew's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. Now, I would have probably gone home and taken a nap because it was already a busy day, but Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. We heard about that in the text today. And then she gets up and serves them. And then at sundown, which is the beginning of the next day in Jewish calendar. Um, so the beginning of Sunday starts, and everybody comes out of their house because the Sabbath is over, and they're bringing all their sick, all of their demon-possessed, struggling people come to the door of Peter's house in Capernaum with all their problems. And Jesus starts to help them and heal them and talk to them and cast out more demons. And we don't know how long this went on. This could have gone on for hours, maybe all night. We aren't really sure. And maybe at some point Jesus just had to say, we have to close the door now and we have to go on with our life and, and take some, you know, sleep, get some sleep before the next day. But he just continues to help people apparently. And then finally at some point Jesus goes to sleep for a very short period of time he gets up, and then he goes off to a desolate place to pray. Now, if it was me or you that were Jesus that day, and we had done all this ministry, 
that we had helped people, taught people, gone to church, preached in church, gone home, healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then healed other people, I think I would have slept in the next day. (laughs) But Jesus doesn't do that. It says he got up early before sunrise and he went out to a deserted place, a desolate place, and he went to pray by himself. So why did Jesus pray? Did you ever think about that? I mean, Jesus is God. So did he talk to himself? You know, when we pray, we talk to God. Well, he didn't talk to himself. No, he had communication with God the Father, another person of the Trinity, right? You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now we have communication between two persons of the Trinity. Jesus is talking to God the Father, and he knows that he needs to talk to God the Father to face whatever he's going to face in the next day and the weeks and months ahead. He is praying to receive strength and guidance from his heavenly Father. And also to remain focused. Okay, prayer helps us focus on the important things of life and to make good decisions and to take the right path in life. You know, we want to talk to God and receive that guidance for our life. So that's why Jesus is going to God the Father in prayer. But what about us? Why do we pray? Um, I like to go back to the catechism, you know, Luther's small catechism, because Martin Luther tried to answer the question of why do we pray and how do we pray in his short explanation. So this is the very beginning. Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? Let's read the words in bold together. With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask him as our dear children ask their dear father. So here's kind of the neat thing, is that we have a God who actually invites us to talk to him. Now, if you look at all the other religions of the world, and I've looked at them all, and maybe you have too, there's no religion that has this kind of relationship, where we have the all-powerful creator of all things, who knows all things, can do all things, But he actually wants to have a relationship and communication with you and with me. So he speaks to us through his word in the Holy Scripture, and he invites us to speak to him in prayer. To actually, as Martin Luther says, as his dearly loved children, speak to our Father in heaven who loves us and who we love. To have this relationship of communication. It's kind of like in our own houses, right? In our homes. I mean, if you're a parent, you want to have communication with your child, right? I know that as they get older, sometimes it's a little more difficult. You know, when they get into adolescence, maybe, or high school, you you have to pry it out of them a little bit, you know? But isn't that communication so important? I kind of find now that when my kids are adults, it's even more important. I'm being in touch with them and communicating with them. You know, and that's what God wants with us, is communication, even though he knows everything. So, right, he knows our mind, he knows what we're thinking, he knows what our feelings are, he knows everything about us, but he still invites us. And even more than invites us, he commands us to talk to him, to speak to him in prayer. And by the way, we don't need to have all kinds of fancy words. We don't have to, you know, memorize King James Version of prayers even though in the Lord's Prayer we typically use that old version, right? Our Father who art in heaven. I was, you know, talk about this in confirmation class with the kids of like, what does art mean? Who art in heaven? Does that mean God's doing art projects in heaven? No, it just means he is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. You know, holy be his name. And may his kingdom come and his will be done as we sang in that opening song, right? So God has given us this great opportunity and invitation and even encouragement and command to pray. In Psalm 105 it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. But sometimes we struggle with prayer, don't we? I mean, if we're all honest, you know, we all could spend more time in prayer. Um, Are we making prayer a priority? I talked about this at our leaders' retreat a few weeks ago with our leader, leaders gathered here at Peace. Um, 
when it actually was snowing one day. It was about three weeks ago. You know, and uh, we talked about this word priority. Did you know that in the English language, the word priority came in in the 1400s? That's when we see the first word priority appearing in English. Now, for 500 years, it was a singular noun, priority. And it wasn't until the 1900s when all of a sudden the IES was added on the end. And all of a sudden in the English dictionaries, it became known as a plural too. It could be a singular or a plural. You can have priority or priorities. Now, why for 500 years was, was it only a singular noun? Priority. It was because you can only have one priority. <laughs> if you have more than one priority, then it's not a priority anymore. But somehow in our modern culture today, we seem to think that we can have more than one priority. We can have lots of priorities. Our life can be filled with so many things. They all become priority, or really nothing becomes priority. So let me apply this in a practical way in your life. How many plates are you spinning right now in your head as you listen to this sermon? So you could have plates spinning of work, of what's going on in your workplace, things that are going to happen tomorrow when you go to work, or maybe you work more than one job, so you have more than one of those plates spinning, and things you have to deal with at each of those jobs. Or maybe you are at school and you got assignments due or papers due or homework to grade or you're a teacher or whatever. You got all that stuff going on. And then what about your family? You got to take care of your kids or your grandkids or maybe your parents. Or maybe you're taking care of your parents and your kids at the same time and grandkids. You got those plates spinning. And then what about all your other activities? What about the sports and, and all the extracurricular things that you're involved with? Leisure time activities. You got all those plates spinning? When our kids were younger, we liked to go camping. So when I was a pastor in Altoona, we had a favorite campground, and I probably mentioned it before, but it was Coon Fork County Park, which is in Eau Claire County. It's very close to where I grew up in Augusta, uh, probably just a few miles from the house I grew up in. And so what we would do is we would pack up all our stuff on a Friday because I had Fridays off. So I would spend Friday packing up the camper for four kids and a dog. So four bicycles, and then mom and dad's bicycle too, of course. So really six bicycles we had to get in there. All the food that we'd need for the weekend. All the stuff. You'd pack up all the clothes and make sure it's all washed and ready to go. And you pack up the camper. And then you drive to the campground. And then you unpack everything. You set up camp. And it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. And kids are running around. Eventually they get there. Usually I went early and kind of helped set up. And then, uh, and then you, you have about a day or so, maybe a day and a half of relaxation and then you had to pack everything up again and clean everything off and maybe you had a rainstorm and then you know you had mud to deal with and all kinds of stuff and then you pack it all back up and you head back home and then you unpack it all put it all away do all the laundry put all the, you know put the food back and whatever you had to do make sure the campers all set to go for the next time and then you're ready for a vacation <laughs> that's usually how i felt about it but isn't that just like a little bit of a microcosm of our life with all the plates spinning, all the stuff going on. It's really hard to say we have anything that's a priority. But Jesus, Jesus knew that going off before sunrise to this desolate place and talking to his heavenly Father was a priority. He had to do it in order to prepare for the next day or the next week or whatever was coming down the line. If there's anything to remember from this sermon, and if you're a note taker and you're writing little notes in the little blank space we give you in the bulletin to take sermon notes, I would just write this down if you don't write anything else. We make God a priority because he made us his priority. We make God a priority because he made us his priority. You know, I think about maybe one of most famous prayers of Jesus was the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus knew what was going to happen. Remember, he's God. So he knew what was going to happen the next morning. He knew what was going to happen that night. He would be betrayed by Judas. He would be put in shackles. I shared with the kids in confirmation this last week. Probably put in a, a pit, in a dungeon at Caiaphas's house. He was already being struck and whipped and abused. And then he's going to be taken before Pontius Pilate and beaten up some more by the Roman soldiers. 
whipped almost to the point of death, but then would carry his cross but collapse. And then Simon of Cyrene would have to finish carrying the cross. Finally get to Golgotha and be nailed to a cross for your sins and mine. Jesus knew that was going to happen because he's God. And so to prepare for that, he prays. He prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. But before he prays that prayer, you know what he does with his disciples in the upper room after they celebrate the Lord's Supper and after he washed the disciples' feet and after he taught the disciples that Thursday night is he prays with them. You can look it up. This is in John 17. It's called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. And it's a whole chapter that's simply Jesus' prayer. You can read what he prayed. And I'll just give it to you in three parts. There's three paragraphs to this prayer. He prays for himself, that God might keep him faithful to the mission that he has to accomplish the next day by going to the cross and dying and suffering for the sin of the world. So he prays that he might glorify God in what he's doing. Secondly, he prays for his disciples, that God might protect them and watch over them in this really hard time they're going to go through because they too will be persecuted and they're going to watch their rabbi, teacher, nailed to a cross the next day. So he prays for his disciples to keep them strong in their faith. And then also he prays for those the disciples would minister to. He prays for the world, those who would believe through the message of telling the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection on the third day to the whole world. So he prays for the world and those who would believe in him later. So he prays for himself, prays for his disciples, he prays for the world. Um, By the way, the way I think about that prayer is concentric circles. And uh, we have a a 40-minute prayer guide that we hand out at the prayer vigil, and um, we'll have some in our prayer racks here, or in the uh, circular racks out here in the narthex for you to use too. But that's the way that's designed, is to pray kind of out from ourselves. We pray for ourselves, we pray for those we immediately and our family, immediate family and immediate workplaces and those kind of things and we just keep praying outward to include prayers ultimately for everybody in this whole world. That's how Jesus prayed. So he prayed that prayer in John 17 and then he took his disciples across the Kidron Valley and he went to the uh, Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane and guess what he did again? Prayed. He prayed again. And he went off, and remember, he went off by himself a little bit, away from Peter, James, John, and the other um, uh, disciples. And he's praying, and they're falling asleep. (laughs) And he does that three times. They keep falling asleep. Jesus keeps praying. In fact, praying so intensely that his sweat is like, and becomes drops of blood because he's so intense in his prayer. Jesus made prayer a priority because he made you a priority and because he made us a priority by suffering and dying and rising for us. We make prayer a priority. At least that's the way God intends it. You know, sometimes we wonder, well, how are we supposed to pray? I mean, you know, how do I do that? How do I talk to God? Again, I already said you don't have to use special words. And we have the Holy Spirit there as a helper who gives us words when we don't know what to pray. But you know, God also gave, besides that concentric circle idea, you know, he gave his disciples a a prayer to use. (laughs) Because the disciples were confused too about, well, how am I supposed to pray? And Jesus said, well, here's how to pray. Uh, By the way, they noticed Jesus was praying. So they said, how do we pray? How do we pray, Jesus? This is in Luke 11. And, And Jesus said, well, here's how you pray. Our Father who is in heaven, help me keep your name holy. Bring your kingdom of grace to this world and in my life. And may your will be done, not mine. And Lord, just provide what I need for this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Right? Not for tomorrow. I'd, help me not worry about tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next month. I'll be focused on today. And, and Lord, just provide for my physical needs today. And Lord, forgive my sins. I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins as I also forgive others. Lord, help me forgive those that are hard to forgive. And God, I know there's temptation all around me, so lead me away from temptation. And deliver me from the evil that's so prevalent in this world today. That was it. 
That was the example, the Lord's Prayer, seven things we pray for. But Jesus said, okay, you're wondering what to pray about. Here's seven things. Pray for this, because we all need to pray for that. So we have that example of the Lord's Prayer. You know, that's a start, right? But there's so much to pray about, just like the kids, by the way. They were, once they got going, they were really good. But here are things we need to pray about in the world today and in our lives today. And God is faithful and hears all of those prayers. A note of caution, though. You know, don't let this crazy, busy, and kind of need for immediate gratification culture we live in temper your prayers. You know, uh, everything needs to be fast, right? So if you order from Amazon, you always look, how long is it going to take to get there? And you can pay extra for, you know, uh, priority. Um, <laughs> Amazon Prime makes you priority, right? Um, or I like the 24-hour uh, picture... Uh, uh, printing off pictures at Walgreens or Walmart or something like that, right? I want it now. Prayers aren't like that. God answers prayers according to his schedule and his time frame, his will. Um, I like the way Zach Zender put it in his book, uh, The Bean Challenge. He said, our cultural expectations have shaped our view of prayer. We pray for something on Monday, and if God hasn't acted by Tuesday, we complain to him on Wednesday, but by Thursday we forgot what we asked for on Monday. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to be patient in our prayers and also submit to God's will that maybe God's not going to answer the prayer the way I want it answered. You can read about that. Uh, Paul talked about it when he talked about his thorn in the flesh, right? And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So praying that God's will is done in however he answers our prayers, but being persistent in our prayers and recognizing that prayer itself is powerful because God promises to work through that prayer according to his will. But it also brings peace. Paul writes these words in Philippians 4, a great promise for our prayer life. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anybody have anxiety? <laughs> they did 2,000 years ago. Paul did. He writes about it, right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, hand it over to God. Recognize that he's in charge, he's in control, and it's okay. And by the way, there's this peace that God washes over you, that God's going to flood into your life, in your prayers. You know, prayers are kind of neat. You can't lie to God. <laughs> you know, he knows what your thoughts are anyway, so you, you can't pull anything over on God. It's the, it's the most honest thing to do in life is to pray. But there's a peace that comes when you hand it over to God. And you acknowledge he's in control. And you honor him in your prayers. And you ask him to guide your decision making. And it helps focus your life on your future. And living your life for him, not for yourself anymore. You know, it's, it's such a relieving thing. So prayer, priority, persistence, powerful, and peace filling. What a blessing to have these promises from God in our life. And the invitation to talk to him as our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Together we confess our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
offerings at this time. Lord, we give you thanks that you have indeed made us a priority. You have sent your Son into this world to redeem us before your very eyes. Help us to remember always to put our faith and trust in you, bringing up prayer first, making it a priority in our lives. Receive these gifts, tithes, and offerings that they might be used for your good and gracious will, that others might come to know that they are a priority uh, before you, the Almighty God. Amen. Better is 
one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. At this time, we come together for the prayers of the church, but we do have just a couple of added petitions in, uh, in addition to what's already in your bulletin. And also, this is uh, a great tool, bring it home. It's got all of our church prayers in here. We're just talking about uh, praying constantly and lifting up uh, prayers for others. So you can bring this home. But in addition to what's in there, we pray for uh, Mary Deborah uh, for healing. We pray for the family of Edith Strandell, who is the mother of Ed, who has passed. So we pray for comfort for that family. We pray for Sandy Lidke, who is the sister-in-law of Rich and Gail. And we also pray for Dan uh, Stockman uh, for healing, and that is a friend of Kathy Florida. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, dear Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh to preach the gospel and cast out the works of Satan and the corruption of sin, which we could not overcome. By your word, rescue us from, evil, from every evil of body and soul. Heavenly Father, Give to all Christian homes the endurance that comes from your Holy Spirit, that husbands and wives, parents and children may be disciplined and self-controlled in their duties, run their course in this life, and continue to the end in the holy Christian faith. We lift up Joan and Jim Marciniak, Heidi, Savea, and Hayden Marks, Dick and Janice Marvin, Deb and Jeff Matt Miller, Denon and Ashley Matt Miller, Jean, Tammy, and Isaac Matt Dazuski. Almighty God, creator of the world and its foundations, you hold sway over the powers of nature and the rulers of the earth. Graciously preserve our land, its produce and industry, and our leaders together with our people. Do not disregard us for our sins, but renew us that our lives may be peaceful and our country governed according to your will. O Lord, your Son is the great physician of body and soul, at whose hand demon, disease, and every ill must turn away. We bring before you those in any need. We lift up today especially Jack, Nancy, Stephanie, Gary, Don, Gloria, Lena, Tom, Bob, Jan, Tom, Jim and Barb, Steve, Dan, Thomas, Mary, uh, Dan and Sandy. We also lift up the family of John Nagel and Edith Strandell. We pray comfort upon them in this time of grief. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me, or rise and join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for this day and for its many blessings. We humbly give you thanks for the opportunity to come and worship you, to grow closer to you and be reminded uh, that you made us a priority, this your creation, that you loved so deeply you would send your son into it. We give you thanks for his example, that we should always be lifting up prayers to you, to have a relationship with you, the one true God. Lord, I ask that you would send us forth with power, confidence, and comfort in our faith amidst you in this world, so that through our actions and words you might use us, that others might be drawn closer to you always, until your kingdom come. Amen. I'll turn it over to Pastor Dave for our announcements. Yeah, just a couple of announcements. Uh, there is an interest sheet out there for any youth that are currently in 8th through 11th grade for the youth gathering in 2025. You can sign your name up there. Thanks for everybody who helped with the pizza fundraiser. Sounds like it was really successful. Yes. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and also anybody interested in the, in the, uh, the Bible Quiz Bowl event uh, down in Wausau, that's also for senior high youth, or junior high? That's junior, junior high, high too. That's, that's all of them. Excellent. Um, Ash Wednesday's coming. It's only a week and a half. February 14th, two services, 4 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. 
with the option of the imposition of ashes as well as Holy Communion at both those services, soup supper in between to support our school. And then that kicks off Lent. So for those Wednesdays during Lent, 4 o'clock service after Ash Wednesday. Uh, and then we're also going to do a men's Bible study at 6 to 7.30 p.m. on Wednesdays, uh, starting on the 21st of February. A follow-up from the men's conference yesterday down at Mount Olive, uh, some of the things that we learned there. So that's whether you attended the conference or not, uh, we do encourage you to go to the men's study. Uh, men's brown bag auction this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Find something worth 20 bucks or so, put it in a brown bag, staple it, that's what I do, staple it, bring it. The proceeds of that auction benefit Camp Luther and sending kids to camp for the first time for free. So men, mark that on your calendar, dinner's included. Um, so that's at 5.30 p.m. this Wednesday right here in the Fellowship Hall. Um, that's it for announcements, and we'll conclude Perfect. with the benediction. God's the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Oh,